First Sergeant Cap with Company B, Second United States Sharpshooters. Thanks for joining us in the workshop. Today I'm going to be showing you how to make octagonal tent poles. These were fairly common during the Civil War. You also see them uh, during the American Revolution and in other sort of uh, historical times. So there's lots of opportunities for these to pop up in the hobby. And asking how to make these used to be a, a fairly common question uh, in the forums in the old days. So I thought I'd go over how to make them traditionally and how to use uh, power tools to accomplish the same result. You can uh, buy these uh, from tent makers and some sutlers. They usually cost quite a bit because they take more time to make and then you also have to factor in you know, the, the weight and size of the, the shipping that goes into shipping tent poles. Uh, but these are fairly easily done at home. It's really important that we kind of address one of the key elements in making philosophy, and that's using the best materials that you can whenever you make something. And that is very true when it comes to something as humble as a tent pole. Um, if you go to the box store and you hit that section of two by twos and all they have left are the nastiest, rattiest boards you've ever seen, they're, they're bowed, they're twisted, they're full of knots, full of pitch pockets, um, just go to a different store and before you leave, ask someone when they get their lumber shipments so that you know when to come back and have first pick of the less expensive two by twos. But when you have something that's bowed and twisted like that, it's going to give you subpar results whether you're doing it traditionally or with modern tools. And especially when it comes to modern tools, having boards that are, are warped and nasty like that are going to be really dangerous to um, use on machinery. So stay away from those. Um, if you're just making a couple for, say, an A tent, it makes perfect sense to walk over to the part of the store where they keep their good boards. They usually call them like select pine. They typically cost two to three times more than your common boards, but they are going to be uh, freer of knots. They're going to be a lot straighter and a lot more square, and they're going to be much safer to use on machinery and give you higher quality results when you're using traditional woodworking tools. So take the time, be really picky on your materials, and you'll be happy every time. Now to get started, you'll only need a few layout tools. Like you see in many of our woodworking videos, you're going to need dividers again. You'll need a small combination square. And if you have an extra metal, metal ruler, I recommend it. It'll uh, save you having to switch setups between these two tools. Then you'll need a pencil. And if you're doing it traditionally, uh, a marking gauge can be really handy, though not necessary. And I'll show you how to get around it in a little bit. In order to lay out an octagon in a square, we have to divide the square into nine equal sections. And to do that, you use your dividers. And you can see here that I set my dividers so I get three equally spaced sections of this square. And then uh, using a Sharpie just for demonstration so you can see it, um, I went ahead and marked these lines. Uh, it, as you're laying out, uh, a nice sharp pencil is preferable. So now we have to lay out lines the opposite direction. And then when you have your part, you just push down on the points and that'll leave you a registration mark to set your square into. You run your line, so we can find, there you go. Now we have nine equal sections. For the octagon, we're cutting off all of these corners. So let's go ahead and draw a line. And these sections will be our waist. If you're doing this traditionally, you'll want to use the largest hand plane that you have. Uh, a Stanley number five would be great for this job. If you had a larger joiner plane, I would probably recommend using that. For extra help with layout so you know when to stop planing, I like to use a marking gauge. And I'll set my marking gauge to the edges of those 45 degree angles and I'll run a guideline 
all the way down the piece and on all those angles and then as you approach your final passes the actual physical scratch that you get from the marking gauge will start to feather up and give you a nice visual clue of when you're uh, just about done with that 45 along the length of the piece. Now if you haven't got one of these yet you can still do that with just a pencil and you'll, you'll use your fingers as the gauge line. So we just get it on the right piece. Uh, you find your corner and then you lock your fingers into place and then you just guide your pencil down the piece and you stop planing when you hit that pencil line on both sides of your octagon and then you just rotate plane rotate plane and you'll be done in no time if you're using a table saw all you really need to do is lay out the first tent pole and then set your machinery to that cut and then you're already set up for repeatability and then you just feed the next pole turn cut turn cut turn cut and you got your, your tent pole the uh, I have a rip blade in my table saw and I have the blade set to 45 degrees that I set with one of these digital angle finders it's not necessary you could uh, easily just sort of line up the blade with the cut that you have marked on your piece. Um, the other thing too is just remember the blade only needs to be high enough to make the cut. That adds a lot of safety. And you need to also consider how you're going to feed the piece through your saw. And again, safety is absolutely paramount. And for that, job I prefer the gripper by Microjig. Uh, this thing really keeps me safe during the operating process. They're not a sponsor but I've really enjoyed uh, this in my shop for quite a few years. Um, you'll see in this demonstration I'm most likely going to get kickback um, because I'm working with such a small piece. Um, it usually doesn't happen when you have a, a large piece but always plan your shop safety in advance. So when you see me make this cut, I'm going to stand out of my way and I want to make sure I don't have anything uh, breakable or at risk behind me. If you're, uh, when you're working with like the six or eight foot poles, I highly recommend that you have a, a competent uh, shop assistant kind of help you on the outfeed side of things and just keep things safe and secure in the workshop. And, and at any point, if you, get to, if you get to the table saw and you don't feel safe making these cuts, don't. I've, you know, I've been working on a table saw for many, many years. I'm fine making these cuts. If you don't feel 100% uh, uh, confident and knowledgeable on how to do this, by all means, go on eBay, go to an antique store, buy yourself uh, a Stanley number no. five and just uh, make these octagonal by hand. And it's a lot safer. And of course, you're going to need some hearing, eye uh, protection, and if you got it, some dust protection. Otherwise, you might want to have uh, like a dust mask or something to keep your lungs safe. So, with that said, eyes, ears, and dust, and let's get cutting. There you have two different ways that you can make octagonal tent poles for your reenacting impression. Now that you have, have them all cut out, uh, you can give them a, a little quick sand if you wanted to. Um, and then all you have to do is find center by crossing these two points and then uh, drill the hole uh, for the size of steel rod that you need to complete your job. I usually um, use uh, like wood glue, but epoxy also works really well too. Uh, if these are going to be outside, uh, depending on your impression, I would highly recommend putting several coats of something like boiled linseed oil on it. Uh, some impressions may require you to paint these, so that might be an option. If you leave them raw, I highly recommend that you paint your bottoms. It just helps um, keep moisture from wicking into the wood and you get more, more life out of your tent poles. 
So before we leave, let's talk about a little bit of documentation. Now, I refer to this thing all the time. It's the 1865 Quartermaster Manual. And I just wanted to share with you what they have written for the description of common tent poles. So this is also going to talk about the, the frame in general because we like documentation. I'm just going to read you the whole thing. So the ridge, 6 feet 10 inches long, 2 and a half inches wide, 1 and 7 eighths inch thick, bands on each end, 2 inches wide, secured by two screws, 1 inch long, one half inch hole, one inch from each end. Upright, seven feet, four inches long, two inches thick, bands on upper end, one and three quarter inches wide, secured by two screws, one inch long, spindles of three eighths inch iron to project out one and a half inch and inserted two inches in upright. Bands and spindles are galvanized. Yes, you heard it here. Galvanized metal was a thing in the Civil War. So uh, I hope this video has been informative and helpful for you. Uh, let us know if you have any questions down below. Thanks as always for liking and subscribing and to stay updated on all of our future videos. Be sure to click that notification bell down below. We'll see you next time.